This episode is brought to you by the Skeptical Buddha, the Tao of Science. My book, which is a thoughtful discourse on Eastern philosophy and how it helped birth ideas required for science and skepticism and the way it fell behind in the face of new evidence. This book discusses the long history of both philosophies as well as the tenets and variations within the varying sects along with psychology and our own natural biases. It discusses how to counter our natural biases using science and the underlying concepts of meditation and mindfulness, a more complex understanding of how science operates than most of the public understands, and why it is the best tool we have to discover truth and reality, as well as philosophical ideas we might embrace as technology progresses. The material is packaged in a way that the average person can understand with rich illustrations to draw the reader in and feel at peace. Welcome to After School Democracy, the podcast that attempts to fill in the gaps you almost certainly missed in school about politics, economics, and history. In the 1940s, coming from the American perspective of freedom of speech and religion, many were horrified to find out that Stalin had completely banned all religion in the country and many other Stalinist puppets followed suit. This helped galvanize religious sentiment against anything left-leaning. However, why was the left so brutal and loathing of religion? Many modern Christians will say it was a way to have a state replace God as a form of control. They're missing a lot of historical context in this statement, treating the church as always having been a force for good. The American experience especially is so different from the more Eastern experience of religion, the two are not even relatable. In the U.S., thanks to the First Amendment, Churches had the right to exist, grow, adapt, and compete in the marketplace of ideas. There was no one church and no religious monopoly, nor did it hold undue power except regionally, even if it didn't on paper. Many horrible things were done by churches, such as rationalizing slavery, but many good things were also done by churches, like the abolitionist movement. So let's cross the pond where the roots and rot of the church goes so much deeper. It's interesting that in most agrarian civilizations, it was the priest class that was the first form of government. However, when at war, they would often select a war king, or essentially their five-star general, to lead the military. Over time, war became non-stop, so the war king just became the king, who solidified his power along with the priest class. One can think of the church as a branch of government. It was referred to in France as the second estate, with the king and nobles being the first estate, and the third estate being the people with pretty much no power at all. If you need more proof, nobles would have their first sons inherit their power and estate, then send their second sons to join the priesthood, to still gain political power. It got so corrupt that they even had to enforce celibacy because the popes became an inherited corrupt dynasty there for a while. Without the support of the church, quite often the king would have no power, which gave them literally ungodly levels of power and corruption. Christian history tried to smear the Vikings for pillaging churches, but that's where all the money was, as they often owned so much land and wealth after bilking the peasants or giving indulgence to knights and nobles that the church was just a cesspool. Wars were fought over religion throughout the centuries, and many lives lost because of the greed of the church and religion. Which is why during the French Revolution, so many wanted to do away with religion entirely. They seized the church's land and redistributed them somewhat to the landless peasants. They did the same to many of the lords and viewed them all equally as vile and corrupt. However, there were still enough religious people in France, so the revolutionary government made a compromise and allowed the clergy to keep their church buildings so long as they would let them be used in the evenings for secular events such as discussion of philosophy. In fact, there was a movement for several years in France jokingly called the Cult of Reason, where they would carve two philosophy over the church doors and have an altar to liberty. It was very much a disorganized religion on purpose. On November 10th, 1793, there was a Fête de Raison, or Feast of Reason, where a woman would dress up in a Roman garb and be the goddess of reason who impersonated liberty, and her attendants were women who also wore Roman garb and the Phrygian caps, or Smurf hats, which was given to freed slaves back in Roman times. Lady Columbia, the symbol of America before Lady Liberty, was often depicted similarly. These fets would often get very wild and scandalous. In 1802, Napoleon took over and banned the cult. Over in the east, where Russia resided, the Tsar's authority was sacred. He was the father of 
of the nation, and his people were his children, and he believed it with complete religious fervor to the level of absolutism and autocracy. This blind belief in his own mythology is why Tsar Nicholas II was unable to see that, yes, he was doing a terrible job, he was unfit to rule, and saw people around him trying to warn him as his house burned down, and Rasputin poisoned their minds as all traitors and heretics. Russia viewed and still views itself as the Third Rome, as Constantinople became the Second Rome as the Holy Seat, and then it fell to Islam, Moscow became the seat of religious power. The church was the Tsar, and the church was corrupt power. The Russians never had experienced religion the way Americans had, which was about decentralized power without a monopoly and not a branch of government, until the religious right rose in the 1980s. Religion in the U.S. was always about the freedom, not only how to worship, but to worship or not if you wanted to. The church had sucked the average person dry for centuries as a hotbed of corruption, and it was nearly impossible to separate the church from the king, so Lenin began to persecute most religions, especially the Orthodox Church leaders, but also Jews in some cases. Stalin stepped this up and banned all religion entirely, and many Stalinist nations followed suit. As Western Europe became more liberalized, their states became more secular, with the ability for people to also worship as they wished, unlike before, where any bad move could have you persecuted if you were the wrong kind of Christian, much less non-Christian. Western Europe gained the halfway mark between Russia and the U.S., many with a state religion that had more and more of their power stripped depending on the nation, but were still considered the state religion, and people had to pay a church tax that much of it went to keep up the old buildings. Western Europe defanged their toxic religion, but thanks to the Iron Curtain, the peoples of Eastern Europe never got to experience how freedom of religion works. Sadly, instead of banning religions, they could have taught their people critical thinking instead, but Stalin crushed all that and ensured that people more blindly believed the state. It's why I still believe religion does more harm than good. However, unlike how it used to be, it's no longer utterly corrupt and toxic and can coexist peacefully. However, in the event of its loss of special status in the U.S., we are seeing its radical backlash embroiling itself more in politics, acquiring money in the form of megachurches, and promoting hate in terms of LGBT+, and anyone not Christian, pushing more and more people to abandon it. It's why I'm not for banning religion at all. It's a terrible idea. Give people the tools to think for themselves, and religion, in my opinion, will die on its own, or will become something hyper-peaceful. But we are also failing our students in critical thinking, especially in areas where the religious right holds lockstep sway and demands purity and book burning. Tax the megachurches into the ground and tax any church that tries to endorse candidates like any other political arm as it's now trying to go back to being a toxic, corrupt arm of the government that turns people off even more to religion and makes people want to ban it all the more. If you demand that an elected leader is the same religion as you are, you are demanding to be lied to, and nothing cheapens a religion more than when it becomes politicized. So if you want to understand why Stalinism and even leftism and early liberalism was so hostile to religion, this is why. Religion was a toxic, corrupt cesspool, while in the U.S. it was a community organizing tool and a way to discuss and spread ideas and provide solace for the average person. Still not incorruptible in the U.S., nor without some serious political influences, but enough of a check on it that it did not sour many to think it was inseparable and worth suppressing the freedom of speech and exercise thereof, unlike many of the socialist nations. So apparently, just like me, most of my subscribers are not a big fans of emojis. A couple of videos ago, I had you try and hack the algorithm by putting down emojis of something, and the results were meh. Anyway, so this time, we'll try something different. Just write in the comments, Smurf hat, if you've made it this far, because we discussed the Frisian caps. Hopefully, that will end up Having the algorithm see this as having more interactions. Thank you. So as always, thank you all for watching this as a video or listening to this as a podcast, which I'm sure was completely uncontroversial to anyone, especially to the YouTube monetization team. So if you found this useful, please donate to my Patreon. Just a reminder that I'm Anubis2814 on YouTube, and I have almost 700 videos on my channel that I've made over the past 11 years on religion, science, psychology, and politics. Please go check them out, and if your site has the option, like, rate, review, and comment. 
A special thanks goes out to Kendall Copperberg, Mylon Mia, Ogrel, Elias Garcia Guevara, and Joe Taylor for their $10 or more Wapawet level donations. I'm always humbled by the fact that they find my work worth funding and worth driving me forward. Thank you all. Please consider donating to my work if you can, and thank you all for listening.